This is nothing short of Nazism. I saw it with my eyes. They were flogging boys, eight in the morning, 24 strokes. They put sand on the body before they flogged them. And this is, a, this is not from court order. This is just water's enjoyment. Best-selling Afrobeat artist and political activist, Fela Kuti was hated by some and loved by many. The new documentary, Finding Fela, puts the Nigerian musician in the spotlight. I recently asked Oscar-winning director Alex Gibney how he got involved with the film. I was pulled into this by Steve Hendel, who produced the um, Broadway show. Mm -hmm. And uh, Steve was interested in doing a film about the cast and crew of the Broadway show taking this show about a Nigerian back to Nigeria, back to Africa. And that, that might be an interesting sort of cinema verite documentary. I, th I thought so too. But one of the things that happened along the way was that Fella began to rear his head and to, to demand equal time, you know, the real fella. The so, real fella. so that's what started to happen. Because we had always thought that we'd juxtapose a little bit of the play and kind of the making of the play. And then along the way, you know, that process of discovery became part of the structure of the film itself. That's why it's called Finding Fella. And my process in terms of understanding who this guy was and learning more about him, I, when I started, I didn't know that a million people turned out for his funeral. Um, it began to mirror the process that we found in some of the footage that that uh, that Steve and others had, uh, and this wonderful woman named Maya, had taken of the play in its embryonic stages, mm -hmm. as Bill T. Jones uh, and some of the other people who were working to put the play together were trying to figure out who this guy was, because they were kind of workshopping it and wondering, you know, mm. who is this guy, which became part of the art of it all. Well, now, having done that, and you, now you're clearly almost an expert on his life, what do you think was the appeal? Because there are things about him, and it's in the documentary, that remind you of the magnetism of a Bob Marley and mm -hmm. people like that, from the compound to the multiple wives. And what do you think was the secret of his power? He's a guy who's always growing. You know, there, there is a, a questing in him that is relentless and a determination to make a difference. And so he was both going inside and outside at the same time. I think that's one of the miraculous things about him. I think not unlike Bob Marley, you know, the art keeps getting better even as he sees uh, things in the world that he wants to change. So the inward looking aspect of an artist who's trying to reckon with the world and, and, and figure out a way to make that manifest and, and, and at the same time, his analysis about what's wrong and his determination to change it, those two things came together in this one man in a way that is very powerful. Straight and progressive, clean government. That knows what he's doing. And his music is how he wanted to make political change and make right. his statement. Talk to me a little bit about the music. It, it's been compared to Parliament Funkadelic at their peak, a number of James Brown's band at their peak. And it's music that makes you want to move, but when you hear what he's talking about, it takes you to another level. It does, the, it does both of those things. And it's a music also, it gets its power, as I think the best music does, from all these disparate influences. I mean, there was even a section in the film uh, and in the play at one point that we, we had to take out for time where, you know, one of his influences, Frank Sinatra of all people, which I never would have reckoned with. Um, but, you know, he's pulling from Yoruba traditions. He's pulling from jazz. He's, he then pulls from James Brown um, and funk. And all of these things are reckoning in a way. And, and his music is, is wild because it is, it, unlike Bob Marley's music, it doesn't come in three to five minute bursts. Right. right? It's not radio friendly. No. It, it, you know, these songs are seven to 30 minutes long. And there's a kind of incantatory quality, you know, where the drums and then the drums followed by uh, the horns and, and, and the... Uh, and the organ, and then finally, just when you think the song's coming to an end, it actually starts, the lyrics come in. So, and, and the music kind of derives its power from that repetition as well, uh, where you get into the groove. That's well, what you know, uh, you do, and, and I have to say, one of the things that really struck me in your documentary is how his legacy clearly is his music, but it's been passed on to his children, right. who've gotten involved, and they actually ended up being in part of his band later in his life. You know, they were very candid with you and said things that, you know, I don't know if I could say about my own parents mm. if they were those type of people. What do you think their feelings are about their father at this point? Oh, I think tremendous affection. But at the, at the same time, I think, you know, one of the great things about him is that um, in some ways his dad 
in some ways their dad was very honest. In some ways maybe he wasn't entirely honest with himself, but in some ways he was brutally honest. And I think they got that from him too, and they had to reckon with their own lives growing up. It's not easy growing up with a legend no. uh, and, a, and a supremely public figure. And I think he showed his affection to them, but in a, almost a kind of a roundabout way. Uh, he, 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 as, as I think Femi says, you know, he, you know, he was very direct about it. He wasn't going to give them affection first. Hmm. Well, the thing that struck me probably the most about Fela uh, as, as a man was his bravery. And that was my biggest takeaway. What was yours, having made this documentary? I think his bravery is, is, is palpable. I mean, this was a guy who was beaten over and over and over again. And by would willingly go, people. knowing he would be, yes, to do and, something. Yes, and he expected it to happen, and he went anyway. Uh, and he was jailed uh, a number of times. After all, he was an Amnesty International prisoner of conscience. Um, he was just determined not to back down. And that's very hard to imagine. I think over time, that took its toll on him. I, and, I, I cannot think, help but do. I think and, and, right. and I think also he was haunted by the idea that his bravery and his willingness to stick it in the eye of the government also probably caused his mother to be killed. Sure. Well, I have to tell you, it's a powerful documentary, and I think everybody should see this movie. So we'll be right back. <laughs> When we return, we speak to someone who knew him best, Fela's oldest son, Femi Kuti, next on Arise On Screen. What does it mean to be out there in the street caring enough that you're going to stick your neck out again to be punched, stabbed, arrested? And that was the part that made him so delightful. He never left Nigeria. He could have been kicking back in Paris, New York. But no, I'm going to stay in there because I'm going to stay in your face. Perverse. Crazy, even. I have death in my pouch. That was Tony Award-winning choreographer Bill T. Jones in a scene from the new documentary, Finding Fela. This film would not exist if it were not for the cooperation of Fela's family and the producer of the play, Stephen Hendel. I spoke with Fela's oldest son, Femi, and Stephen about their journey to bring Fela Kuti's life to the stage and screen. I asked Femi if making the film was a cathartic experience for him. I always felt, as, especially after his death, that it was very important for his music and his struggle to get out of the world. So when Steve came with this big pro project, I, I welcomed it very much. Now, what made you think that Stephen would be the man to bring this, not just to the stage, but then to document his life and all of that? What, made, what is it about him? I never knew this, I, but I knew my life will always be um, entangled around his life. and. Um, touring with my band and always talking politics around the world. I always made sure I always spoke about him or his struggle or the problems in Africa or Nigeria. And so this was my way. And I just dreamt secretly that hopefully there will be a big movie or something. And then remember the play was off Broadway for a very long time before it did get on Broadway. So I already knew about the play off Broadway. And so many things were happening about my father. A lot of people are now talking about him. We're here, Miles Davis' book came out talking that he, he was inspired by my father's music. And I found this very, very um, touching for me because my father was inspired by Miles Davis. For Miles Davis to come later, so many years later, to be inspired by my father, then to know that Paul McCartney Lennon were listening to him, then I just figured that, well, wow, a lot of American greats must have been listening to my father's music secretly because I could hear his groove in many of the beats coming out of America. As far as Africa is concerned, music cannot be for enjoyment. Music has to be for revolution. Music is the way for. Now, for you, you, you discovered his music by accident. What about it resonated with you and, and made you think, you know, I'm going to go from being a commodities broker to producing play? The first time I heard it, it was like being overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed. I just never heard anything 
as rich and as powerful and then also as poetic and as meaningful as this music. And I just kept listening and listening and then, uh, you know, understanding the words, understanding what he was singing about, what he had done with his life. And I just thought this was so unbelievable. What a story. And we didn't know it in the United States. I am Bella, who no mortal can ever kill. So let us turn Nigeria upside down. Well, now, what made you think uh, that uh, a theater audience would embrace this the way you did? Given the music and the intensity of the, of the themes in the story, um, that you could put it on the stage and have it be something that people would react to viscerally and, and, and have a huge emotional collective experience. And I also have to say, I didn't really know what I was doing. <laughs> Your dad's music was, uh, had a lot of political statement, it was going against authority, and you're a Grammy-nominated musician in your own right. Uh, what, what do you try to do with your music, and, and how do you relate it to what your dad did? Um, if you listen to my father's work from the very beginning, his first hit called Jengoku. I think this was the foundation of the Afrobeat. And then it goes on to a track called Fight to Win, Alu John Joy Kijo. This was the this was the era that I think for me was most precious to my soul, my spirit. And I love those short versions of his music. I think it was very dynamic and very straight to the point, like a hit, so to say. So I never forgot that era. But as my father grew fighting, his songs became very musical, very classical, very, but putting you more in a trance than being direct and like hitting that kind of mm. Ali or Mike Tyson knockout blow. Right, right. <laughs> so, and I, I always love that knockout blow. So what I did, what I'm doing now is keeping that knockout blow that was so precious to me. I tr that I treasured so much as a kid, and I use that with my songs now. So a song like Bang 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 or the last album or why I probably am getting nominated is people are seeing that I'm trying to, still trying to keep my father's latter of work in my music, but not hesitating to keep that knockout blow, blow to always hit the audience. So you just, wow, what's this? So you, you hear it first time, you are attracted to the music. I have, of course, keeping my identity. So you can always distinguish between my father's groove and my groove. Your groove. My groove is more, I would say, you know, I hate talking about it because people might think I'm being critical or trying to overpraise myself. But don't worry, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> my, my groove is, I had to quickly find my voice and the first um, thing I could think about was, okay, maybe I should go very fast. Uh, so I had a very powerful, fast groove, which Nigerians did not, not like. They pr preferred my father's laid-back laid Afrobeat groove. Right. So I was making a name in Europe, especially in France and Germany, Switzerland, before Nigeria. It took nearly a decade for Nigerians to accept my kind of Afrobeat. Music. Well, thank you. Well, I have to say, and now I feel like you guys must have doing this documentary every time you learn something more about Fela, more and more yeah, and more. Yeah, you can't learn. You so, can't get to the bottom <laughs> No, of you it. can't. Well, <laughs> the documentary uh, just came out this week, and we'll be right back. I am Fela, who no mortal can ever kill. Up next, Enough, we'll review Finding Fela here on Arise On Screen. As far as Africa is concerned, music cannot be for enjoyment. Music has to be for revolution. Music is the way for I'm Mike Sargent. I'm here with film critics Rakia Mays and Julian Roman. And you know, it's interesting watching back those uh, interviews. I'm reminded what struck me about the documentary was his bravery. But for you, Rakia, you said you found the film inspirational, but what struck you most was his attitude towards women. <laughs> you caught me off guard with that one. Okay. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate All that. Right. Um, it was inspirational. As mm -hmm. an artist, you know, Fela, and I hadn't seen his play, and I only knew him for his music, but to mm -hmm. know that he used his art for advocacy and for activism and to make a change in the world as an artist, it shows that we all, in a way, have a responsibility to do things like that. Um, 
As a woman, Fela and his many wives, he was definitely a rock star. Well, he was trying uh, to make a statement, too. Well, he was making a statement, I guess, in his own way. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I wouldn't have been one of those women, although I did appreciate the sister, the black power sister that actually put him on mm -hmm. to using activism to change the world. I and thought that was very interesting, I too, that he, that. experiencing what was happening here with the yes. civil rights movement and reading Malcolm X's autobiography, yes. changed his perspective on what he could do with his music. An African-American woman did that, and she also did not stand for being one of his wives. <laughs> no, she I did appreciated not. that. You appreciated that? I did. <laughs> now, Julian, you, on the other hand, while you liked the music, you felt the documentary was, it, you used the word that it was uh, formulaic. It, and it was that wrote. It, it was wrote. And wrote. Now, what kind of formula, what's a formula for a documentary. Well, I mean, this is the, the film critic view of the world because you're seeing many, many films. Alex Gibney, the director, has done 12 documentaries in four years. Mm -hmm. I guess he works on some of them in parallel. Now, the Finding Feel is very interesting. It talks about the guy really, as knowing a famous, you know, black Nigerian activist, it's very, very important. But here you go, you have archival clip, right? You have a song from the theater. You have archival clip. You have an interview. It seems to me very one, two, three, very like a peanut butter sandwich put together. And after a while, well, you don't want to be known for being a one-trick pony, you know? And so I think with Alex, is if he had done this over time, like the Marley documentary that was done over 10 years, well, yeah, okay. yeah, it would have more substance, but this one, I felt like I was just seeing another one of his documentaries. And I think that, you know, Kuti Fela, Fela Kuti deserved more for, than that, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that was, that. I, I have to say, I, I enjoyed it. I would have wanted more, too, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind seeing a biopic on him. Oh, so, me too. So, well, it's definitely been a lot of fun, and uh, I want to thank you both for being here. Thank and you. I'm Mike Sargent, and we'll be back next week here to talk more movies on Arise On Screen. <laughs>